Hello everybody, welcome to another HD DWF arcade repair. This is the second Zakaria board repair of a few ones that I received to be serviced. It is a Zakaria Galaxia CPU board. The game is basically very similar to the original Midway Galaxian, but more difficult in general, and with an added fuel gauge that will kill a life if it gets empty. Sometimes the cabinets of this game were labelled as Super Galaxian. This game PCB is very similar to the Astro Wars one that I shown in a previous video, so a lot of prerequisite information are on that video that are linked down in the description. For instance, it uses the same Zagnetix S2650 8-bit CPU. But on this one we have three S2636 instead of the single one used in the Astro Wars board. This allows more sprites and more different sounds. And also this board has been serviced before. Here are a few replaced TTLICs. Socket 2114 RAMs. More socketed TTLICs. Another one here. This TTL PROM was also replaced. More socketed 2114s and more socketed TTL buffers. Unfortunately, this PCB must have been stored in a very damp place or got partly flooded. I will try to clean the residues the best I can. This is how the board looks like after quite some brushing with isopropyl alcohol. I hope no traces got really damaged under the solder mask. During the first physical inspection, I've also noticed this poor ceramic capacitor that has been snapped almost in its center. Well, actually, it must be more like 70% of the original size, since its nominal value should be 100 picofarads. However, I have replaced it with a spare one having the correct capacitance and temperature coefficient. Then I checked all the diode and transistor junctions without finding any evident problem. And last but not least, checked all electrolytic ESR values and even in this case I found no obvious issues. Since I have four different Galaxia CPU boards to service, I first dumped and checked all EEPROMs of all boards. I checked all different dumps against the online ROM ident. Not all EEPROMs had known dumps or could be read at all. On the board and servicing now, three ROMs had unknown dumps, so I've tried them all on MEME to decide if they are bad or just not previously found elsewhere. This is ROM at 1D position. As you can see, the aliens in the formation are not very well drawn, so this is likely bad. And this is what happens with ROM at 3D position. Also in this case, aliens in the formation do not look too good. However, the unknown dumps of the 10H EEPROM seems working just fine. Actually, another identical 10H EEPROM was found on the other boards where their lab shows a BN indication, that's the Italian acronym for black and white, so maybe this were intended for a cabinet with a black and white monitor. However, the black and white set also clearly has two different and previously unknown EEPROMs at 1D and 3D position and their dump does not match the ones I found on this board. So I decided to erase and reprogram both 3D and 1D with the known dumps. 
and also replaced the 10H with the noun dump that's probably best suited for the color version of this game. This game PCB has almost identical connections as the Astro Wars one that I repaired before, so I can use all the harness I've already made when working with the other board. The video output will go through an RGB polarity inverter to allow my monitor to display the negative polarity signals produced by this arcade board. The tiles and schematics of this inverter are on my previous repair video, linked into the description. Mm, unfortunately, nothing is displayed on the monitor at all. So, as with every CPU, we must check the reset signal, which is on pin 16, and the clock input on pin 38. And sure enough, when looking at the clock pin, there is no square wave. The main clock generator is a crystal oscillator at 14.3818 MHz using a 74S04IC at 13A. Then this clock is divided by 4 by the 74S112 at 13B. The second half of this IC is marked at 12B, but that's a mistake in the schematic, so let's check these two ICs first. We have a signal on pin 13, which is one input of the 74S112, but all the output pins seem stuck. The clock signal is correctly present at pin 1, 2, so I think this IC must be bad. So I have removed the old 74S112 and replaced it with a spare one. Now the CPU clock is present. And the game goes into the attract mode, but I can spot a few issues. First, notice the S in high score that has a red color and should be yellow like the rest of the letters. Then, after a few minutes, the star field disappears completely. But if I power cycle the game, it returns again. But notice it doesn't move smoothly, but shows a glitchy movement. Now, the star field is produced by this part of the circuit board. Basically, it's a pseudo-random number generator. It is made with two LS-164 8-bit shift registers, plus one half of an LS-74 working as an additional 1-bit shift register. So the total length of the register is 17 bits. The input bit to the first register is obtained with the exclusive OR of the fifth tap and the inverted last tap, because the ABSEQ signal is actually taken from the pin 6 of the LS74, which is the negated output. So, basically, the fault can only be somewhere in these four ICs, but of course, we must first make sure that the ST on signal and the register clock are correctly working. The first thing I noticed is that one of the two LS164 was already socketed and probably replaced. The IC on the socket is this one. The actual markings are very faint, but we can read the start of the pan number, which is the M7, and last part, which is 4N. The space in the middle can only contain three characters, so this is for sure a 74164 and not a 74LS164. Now, the old plane 74 family and the 74LS family have very similar speed, but the old 74TTL need about two or three times the input current needed by a 74LS IC to toggle reliably. So I substituted the chip with a 74LS164. Unfortunately, this didn't fix the problem, but I don't see any reason for having an old plain 74IC where the schematics calls for a 74LS1. 
So, to identify what is the actual marginal IC, I thought I would try piggybacking the remaining ICs of the Starfield generator one by one. I started with the LS74 in position 6O. And sure enough, now the Starfield moves smoothly without jumps, and it never disappeared after several minutes of testing. However, before removing the original 74 LS74, I remember that sometimes when piggybacking a TTLSC solves an intermittent issue, that may be because of a marginal power supply voltage. Now, my power supply is spot on set at 5.0 volts, but when I measure the power supply right at the pins of the 74 LS74, I had a bit more than 4.6 volts, which is really too low. Then I cleaned one by one all the pins of the power supply connector, and now the supply voltage at the opposite corner of the board with respect to the power input is 4.87 volts, which is right at the lower end of the TTL supply range. But that must not cause any issue now. Also, on the arcade cabinet, power supply can be usually set up to 5.1 or 5.2 volts, but remember to never exceed the 5.2 volts anyway. It is now time to address the other issues. The red S in high score. Then notice the alien formation just make some few large jumps when moving around. It doesn't move smoothly back and forth as it should. Also notice two more issues. The ship's fire is not aligned right to the ship bottom, but it's offset to its right. And the word empty on the fuel meter appears to be missing the first two letters. So it is time to go back to the schematics. This is a not so good scan of the circuit that draws most of the objects on the screen. This circuit has a hardware shift to allow the CPU to move back and forth the alien formation without needing any calculation. The character RAM is made with two 2114 static RAM ICs. These two will drive a couple of character EPROMs that contain the actual object shapes. These two 74LS173 4-bit latches are part of the hardware shift. The CPU will write an 8-bit value on them and that will be used to shift part of the character RAM. The actual shift is realized by summing the latch content with the screen scan addresses. The sum is obtained with two 74LS283 4-bit adders. Of course, we don't want all the screen content to be shifted back and forth, so this other IC in position 4A will output a low value on ESH line when the middle part of the screen is being drawn. That's exactly where the alien information is. When the signal is high, the latches output are disabled and the screen is not shifted. Now we can look for any problem on these relevant ICs. Let's look at the latches outputs. Outputs toggling are likely good. But this one on 3B is stuck low. So that was easy enough. I pulled that LS173 and substituted it with a spare one. And now that output is not stuck anymore. Looks like that this one solved almost all issues, except of course for the red S. Character cores are held in two separate static 2102 type RAMs in positions 3C and 1B. They can store 1 kilobyte by 1 bit each, so it could be just a faulty RAM location on one of them. Actually, the color RAM at 3C was already socketed, so I've just tried a non-good one in its place. And yes, the S is not red anymore, but yellow as it should be. Ah. 
I will now exercise the coin's inputs. Credits will increase if all is working properly. Well, these tests usually produce some bouncing on the signals, of course. Now I tested the one player start input and it worked fine. Also, the two players game start works correctly. Left and right inputs also work. And last, the fire input is also working. For further information about the slightly unusual input circuits of these games, have a look at my previous video linked in the description. Well, it seems this game didn't like to be fixed so quickly. It now developed another rather funny problem. The alien's shapes in the formation change as the formation itself moves, and also the ship is not drawn correctly and depends on where on the screen is being drawn. The characters on top and bottom of the screen are also incorrect. And strangely enough, the push start button words are displayed correctly. This is rather weird. Another part of the character display circuit that we didn't cover before is the address multiplexers. These are needed to allow either the CPU to access any location of the RAM with its own address bus, or allow the video generation circuit to scan the RAM contents when the screen is being drawn. Whoever attempted to fix this board before has already socketed and replaced two of the three LS157 multiplexers. Only the one in position 4C is still original. I suspected this one, of course, but I couldn't find any hint of a problem by looking at its outputs with the oscilloscope. However, I've decided to try substituting that LS157 anyway. And of course, it didn't solve the problem, so I should have trusted what I was seeing with the oscilloscope. With both the 2114 RAMs socketed, all the LS157 multiplexers also socketed, and having already substituted one of the two LS173 and carefully checked again the remaining one, Almost the only other possibility is that the fault is on one of the two LS283 4-bit adders. However, I'll try to first think about a good method to identify if one of them is indeed misbehaving, since I don't want to pull another good IC on this board. Now, in general, to check a 4-bit adder in circuit, I would probably need a logic analyzer to look at all the inputs and the outputs at the same time. However, I don't have a logic analyzer. Anyway, I think in this case I can take a shortcut. First, observe that one adder has its carry input tied high with a resistor, and the second adder is cascaded by getting the carry output of the first one. Then we notice that when the carry input is high and one of the input port is also high, the outputs will just replicate the other input port bit by bit, and this is true for both our cascade adders, since in this case the carry output is also high and that goes to the carry input of the cascaded one. So all I need is to have one input port fixed with all high bits, but how to do that? One port of the others is connected to the video scan counters, and that is coming from a series of clock dividers. I cannot easily disable them, and anyway, that would make the whole system misbehave, in unpredictable ways probably. The other input port is coming from the latches that the CPU writes to make the all information shift. So, all it takes is to make the CPU write all once in the latches, and then halt. That's easy, right? Actually, the CPU writes all once on the latches as part of the screen initialization. 
Then, if I keep the CPU in reset after it cleared the screen, like this, I can now check that all the other outputs must follow the toggling video scan counters. Output toggling, input high, input toggling, and check this pattern for every three pins of both adders. Ok, here we have a problem. This output is stuck low. Input high. Yeah, input toggling. And yes, this is stuck low. If I lift the CPU reset, it starts toggling though. So that LS283 was substituted with a spare one. And the problem is now fixed. Hmm, seems that something else decided to die in the meantime. That's going up. And start a game. Now, whenever I use the fire input, the ship fires and moves to the left at the same time. It's time for the schematics again. The input circuit on these Zachary arcades is a bit unusual. Whenever the program needs to read any input, including the deep switch settings, it makes a particular I.O. read operation where the three lowest address lines, A0, A1 and A2, make one of the outputs of this 74LS155 go low. So, for example, if the program needs to know the status of deep switches at 2N block, it will make the output number 4 go low, and the diodes D1 to D6 will conduct if the corresponding deep switch are closed. All the other diodes not connected to the select low line will not conduct because they have a more positive voltage on their cathodes respect to their anodes. During the same I.O. read operation also this 40097 CMOS buffer gets enabled and it transfers to the data bus at 0 bit for every closed input that's also selected by the enabled line. This buffer needs to be a CMOS one and not a TTL one to allow the low level to be offset one diode drop higher than the zero volt level and a TTL input will not cope well with this. Of course, all external inputs need the series diodes too. Now, in the circuit, only two ICs can fail, if, of course, we first exclude that the select signals on the address lines have not failed in some ways. One failure mode could be one input of the CMOS buffer failing permanently low, and another one could be two or more outputs of the LS155 going low at the same time. Unfortunately, the software reads the inputs only during the screen vertical retrace period. So, I tried to see these few microseconds read operations once every 20 milliseconds, but that's a hard job for my analog scope.
So I came up with a simple test circuit to check if any two outputs of the LS155 are going low at the same time. A simple O gate like the ones in a 74LS32 will do the job. As long as any of the two inputs is high, the O gate's output will also stay high. So unless the LS155 is faulty, I should never see the output of the O gate go low during the game. So I took a 74LS32, I connected the BCC and ground pins and the two inputs of the first gate to the two enable lines that selects either the fire input or the left and right inputs. And I connected the logic probe to the all gates output. Let's go in up the game and start our player game. Yeah, look at that, it's blinking. It means uh, the two outputs are indeed going low together. So that 74LS155 has been substituted with this East Germany made equivalent that you may have seen on a previous video. Good, now the fire input does not also make the ship more left. Left and right inputs work normally, so far so good. These games have a separate sound PCB, so I've also got this one to be repaired. Here we have a broken capacitor. Mm, the audio final amplifier is missing too. This board looks like a factory modification. According to the schematics, the daughterboard is indeed a modification of what appears to be an early Galaxia Sound PCB prototype. However, I have replaced the missing audio amplifier and a broken capacitor, so this board can now be tested. The connection between the sound and the CPU PCBs is almost identical to the Ostro Wars one that I already have made, but this game needs an additional wire that can be easily added anyway. Let's go in up and start the game. Well, it looks fine as far as I can play without a real console. So, I hope this quite long arcade repair was interesting for you and that you learned something new. If you have any questions, please use the comment section below. It's all for now. Have a nice time and thank you for watching.